So, you know jujitsu, right? Now, you want to teach everybody, right? Do you want to run your own school? I think you need to know these things. Hey everyone, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu-Jitsu. I hope you're doing well. So, you want to run a jiu-jitsu school, don't you? A lot of people do. For the life of me, I don't know why. I kind of fell into this by accident. I have been doing jiu-jitsu for decades, and it wasn't until six years ago when we opened Kama Jiu-Jitsu in Dallas that I ever thought about doing one. But I'm here to help you out. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, why do you want to run a jiu-jitsu school? That's probably the most important question because that is the very first question you have to answer. If you don't have a good reason why in your mind, then don't do it. Because jujitsu is fun. At least it is for me. Hopefully it's for you too. But sometimes running a school is not fun. Sometimes jujitsu is our outlet for whatever we do normally in life. And you don't want to make your hobby, your outlet be drudgery. Now, how would that happen? Well, sometimes running a school will take the fun out of your jujitsu. In which case, if you're like me and you have no other hobbies, if jujitsu is not fun for me, what am I going to do? Right? There, there's, I have to figure something else out. And me being 52 years old, eh, I've already got my life pretty much set the way I want it to be. And I don't want it to be, I don't want any part of it to be drudgery. You know, it all, it all has to be good for me. So that's your first question. Ask yourself why and jot the reasons down that justifies why you want to run a school. If you can't give yourself a good why, there's no harm in not running a school. Just do what you're doing already. So the first question is why? The second question is, should I be an instructor for hire or should I be an owner? That's a huge difference. Once you decide, you know, if it's fun just going to the jujitsu school that you're at and teaching, whether it be for money or not, my guess is that since you're thinking of running your own school, the money has to be part of it. Maybe you think jujitsu school owners make a lot of money. I'll tell you right now, most don't. A few do, but most don't. So if you look back at our Pareto principle video, right, the top 20% make 80% of the money. So the top 20% of school owners make 80% of all the money made in a jujitsu school, pretty much. So just know that if you're going to be an owner, you're going to be one of the 80% that makes only 20% of the money for a period of time. After which point, if you can continue on with this journey, then you'll perhaps be one of the ones making more money. I don't know. You know, I hope you do it, but just know sometimes you're better off just being an instructor versus an owner. I'm not trying to discourage you. There are benefits to both, but sometimes you may just want to be an instructor because another reason you might want to think about if I own the school, I want to own a school because I want to control everything, right? I want to determine the, how the school is run. I want to determine everything. Whereas if you're just coming in as an instructor for hire, you just come in, you teach and you're out, right? You can just kind of, it's like grandparents with kids, right? When grandparents come in to their to to their to meet with their grandkids, they go and spoil them, take them to ice cream, and drink Dr. Pepper, and give them candy and all that kind of stuff. And then what do they do? They have all that good time with the with the kids, hand them back to the parents. Let the parents now deal with the fact that kids got sugar high now, right? <laughs> and one thing you can also consider is one of the videos I did very recently talked about risk, right? The risk of the owner, they bear all the risk whereas the instructor for hire bears no risk. So go back to that video. Rusty will put it right up there. You can go and watch it and you can kind of get a refresher on this part of it. So if number one is why, and number two is, do you even want to be a school owner or an instructor? The number three is, I'm assuming you want to be an owner. So number three would be, have you ever read the book called The E-Myth? E-Myth, and it's by Michael Gerber. E stands for entrepreneur. Because if you're going to be an owner, you're now going to be an entrepreneur. So this is a very important book to read. And I would recommend you go and hit the link down in, this, in the description and you can get it uh, through one of our links on Amazon. But it's a book you need to read if you want to be a business owner. If you have read it, 
then you already know what I'm talking about. Why is that book important? What Gerber does is he uses as a couple of examples. One was uh, a woman who, I think she's a baker. Yeah, I, I read this book like 20 years ago. Um, but she was a baker and her thinking was, I'm doing all the work for my boss who owns the bakery. Perhaps I'd be better off running my own bakery, right? That's like the jujitsu school teacher. You know, I'm teaching and I'm the one that's teaching all of the classes here. Uh, the owner of the school is out doing all kinds of other stuff, but I'm here holding down the fort. Maybe I should do my own school. Maybe, maybe not. So what he describes in this book, among other things, I'm just going to give you one of the lessons he talks about, was this woman who used to just come in and bake and then leave. Now she realizes she can't just bake. She has to run the business. She's the entrepreneur. She has to deal with regulatory issues. She has to deal with licensing. She has to deal with the, the food inspector, all those types of things that she never had to deal with before. Conversely, what happens? Either your day gets really long because you have to add that, those tasks on top of your baking duties, or you're going to be baking less because you're having to spend time doing the other stuff. Now you're going to have to bring in an apprentice baker. So that's just one example. But yes, go ahead and get this book. It's not a really long book, but it will kind of open your eyes to the landscape that you'll be looking at if you decide that you want to go that route. So if number one is why do you want to open a school? Number two is you decided you want to be an owner. Number three is you read the e-myth. Number four would be, do you have any experience running a business? You don't have to be an experienced business owner or having run a business before to open a school, right? There's always that first time. You don't need to have run three, four, five businesses and then say, well, yeah, I've done it before so I can do it. Yes, it actually helps to have business experience, but that's not to say that your first business cannot be your jujitsu school. Just like your first business can be anything you want, right? It's just a matter of here's my hobby. I love doing it. And I want to take it to the next level. I want to do it full time. I want to make my living off of it. So if you've ever run a business, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't run a business before, you're going to have to jump on a pretty steep learning curve because if you've never run a business, you don't know what you're confronted with. If you have a team of mentors or a, a circle of friends who have experience running a business, perhaps they can help you. Otherwise, you're going to have to hire yourself some advisors. They have some people that actually advise people on running a business, right? Maybe through Clarity or something. You know, I've gotten some people coming over to me on Clarity and, and asking me, and I've spent some time going over some concepts with them to run the business. Or you maybe have a, a, a CPA who you trust or an attorney that you trust. You can have them help you as well. So find yourself an advisor or two or three who can help you. It's better to pay the money to an advisor if you need to hire them to find out if what you're going through is the wrong thing than to not pay the money and realize after you've spent a ton of money in your business that you've done the wrong thing, right? Think of it as buying a used car. I have no mechanical experience with cars. I know how to start it up and just drive it. So when I buy a car, especially a used car, I'll make sure to spend the money to send it over to, an, to a mechanic that I use all the time. And it costs me like $100, $120. And if I like the car, you know, I go and drive the car and it seems like it's okay, but I don't know. So I'll say, okay, go ahead and meet me at this particular mechanic's place. I'll make the appointment. I'll pay the mechanic $120. He does the used car check for me, comes back with a list of issues. It says, this car needs this, 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 and this. So now I have to make a decision. Do I still want to buy this car knowing that it has these issues? Or do I try to negotiate it down or do I walk away from it and just say, you know what, that $120 is well spent because then I'm not going to be out several thousand dollars trying to fix something that I could have walked away from. Same thing with a business. If you pay the advisors who are in the know about what you want to do so they can kind of tell you what you're looking at, you, you know, sp spend that money, that whatever money it is. It's not going to be a lot, but it might be a few hundred or maybe a thousand dollars. I have no idea. Spend the money and ask them, get your answers and then realize, okay, yeah, maybe I shouldn't do this. Sure, you did pay that money up front, but it's not like owning a business where you're going to spend a lot of money. So.
So to summary on this, this particular concept, it's get yourself some advice. Now, after you know why you want to be an owner in this case, you've read the e-myth, you've gotten some advice. What's the next one? Have you ever written a business plan or can you write a business plan? But more importantly, once you've written out this business plan that takes you out for your first five years, can you follow it? Right? I've done a number of calls on Clarity where business owners would call me and I asked them early on in the conversation, do you have a plan? Believe it or not, some people have no plan. And the ones that don't have a plan, okay, now they're in trouble because they've already stepped into the, into the realm of, of opening a business, but they didn't know where, what direction they would go or how they would get things started. No clue. The people who have a plan, I've found a lot of them have a plan and I ask them, do you have a plan? Yes, I have a plan. When was the last time you read your plan back to yourself? Oh, it was when I wrote the plan. Okay, so how many years are you into your business? Two years. Okay, good. How many years was your plan for? Uh, I didn't have a time period. Okay, so you need to do a plan for five years at least. So do your one-year plan, your two-year plan, do a five-year plan. You can even do a 10-year plan if you want, but when you're getting out that far, it's a little further out. The first five years are probably the most important. You have to know where you're planning to go. Now, does that mean it's going to be set in stone? No, because your assumptions could change after the first year or two. You go, oh, you know what? What I thought was going to be actually is a little bit different. So adjust that, and then you're going to have to adjust your five-year plan. But at least you have a five-year plan. Now you're just going to change a little bit here and there, but you're still heading out in that direction. But more importantly, if you write your plan, which if you don't, it's foolish, but when you write your plan, can you follow it, right? Because you're going to take a lot of time, and you may even spend money to have somebody help you put together that plan, but you need to follow the plan. If you don't follow the plan, then why even go through the hassle? So now that you got one through five here, you've written out your plan, and you know you're going to follow your plan. Okay. Now, as part of your plan, you need to have a location. Are you planning to locate in an existing facility, it, it could be anything. It could be inside of a gym. It could be inside of another martial arts school. It could be inside of a church. I've seen jujitsu schools started inside of churches. It could be in your garage. It could be anywhere, right? Anywhere you can lay down mats, you can start. Have you decided you're going to go that route? Or do you want to go with your own specific facility? 24-7, that's your place. Where you locate initially is really important. And I'll tell you why. If you choose an existing space, then your time slots will be limited. You won't be able to have that place and run classes all kinds of times. For instance, your location or your area may be a place where people live there, but they leave to go to work and they come back at night. If that's the case, you might be better off having early morning hours. Or what if you're in an area where there are no kids, right? Kids like to train between the hours of, say, 3.30 to 6, right? You need to have that place. Now, what if you're in an existing facility, let's say it's a martial arts school, and those time slots aren't available to you? Or what if you're in a church, and the church has certain things happening on Wednesday night, uh, Friday night, where they have these various Bible studies, and you can't, you can't run your classes during those days? Does that meet with your student base? Does that, does, does that align with your student base? On the other hand, you can go with your own space and you can run classes anytime you want. Problem with having your own space is that you have to pay much larger rents. And number two, an issue besides coming with a much larger rents and you have it 24 hours a day, you're going to need to fill that space up, right? Because you're paying so much, you have to make the most use of the hours available in a particular day. So here's how you think about it. What if you're the only instructor? 
Are you going to do the early morning 6 a.m.? Are you going to do the mid-morning 10 a.m.? Are you going to do the lunch hour class? Are you going to do the kids' classes starting at 4? Are you going to do the evening classes starting at 6 or the late evening classes starting at 8? Well, those are all your time slots in a given day that you could do, that you would need to fill up because now you have this place 24-7. You have to be able to do that to justify paying all that money, right? And with a lease, with a lease here for your own space, it could be a three-year lease and a five-year lease. And they're going to hit you personally. When I say hit you personally, it means they're going to ask for a personal guarantee. If the business doesn't pan out, they're going to sue you for the rest. So you have to look. And let's say it's $3,000 a month. Okay, that's $36,000 a year. right? And then that would be about $180,000 that you're going to be on the hook for, for a three-year lease or a five-year lease, excuse me. $180,000. If you decide at the end of year two that you just can't continue running the business, you don't have enough students to sustain you, you're still on the hook. You know, the, the landlord will get you because you had a personal guarantee, which means they'll go after your assets. And that lease that you signed says that they can do that. Right? Oh, but I have a corporation and all that. Well, yeah, but in this case, to sign the lease for you, since you've never had a lease, they went around that and got to you personally. Is that something you can sustain, right? You need to think about that. Now, number seven, let's say you decided to do this. Do you have enough money in your new company's bank account to sustain you? We already talked about the numbers with regard to the, the, the five-year commitment. Let's say with a five-year lease, that's $180,000 at $3,000 a month. And that's just paying the rent. You have this thing called triple net, which is basically your, your maintenance and your maintenance around the building, perhaps. Also your water, uh, that's included in your triple net. You usually have to pay your electricity separately. AC units, AC units sit on the roof of the building. And when those go out, guess what? They're not your landlord's units, they're now your units. So you're gonna have to put the unit back in. Let's say that unit costs $20,000. Let's say one month into you signing the lease, it's now your place for the next five years or three years, it doesn't matter. Your AC unit goes out. You have to replace it. Well, guess what? Although it's attached to the building and the building is owned by your landlord, that AC unit is your responsibility. And get this, once you put in the money to replace the unit, let's say it's $10,000, right? You're now out $10,000 and let's say you go out of business. If you go out of business, or even if you leave the place in five years from now, being that it's attached to the building, it's no longer yours. It's only yours if it breaks, which is weird. I never understood that because if you lease an apartment, the AC unit is your landlord's. But in commercial, it's different. So you're going to have to be able to sustain the cost. So now what's an appropriate amount? Figure on, assuming you don't have a ton of students waiting, knocking on your door to, to sign up with you as soon as you open, figure on at least $100,000 because you're gonna to need to build out your space. You're gonna to have to pay your first months and your last months. Plus you're gonna to have to furnish your space. And then you're gonna to have to then have an emergency, not emergency fund, but a cushion to take you until your business becomes profitable. Oh, several, more than three. I mean, I have it maintained, right? So every six months, three to six months, I have to bring the guy in to, to maintain it. Every time he comes in, it's like $170. Right. But if the unit breaks, then I have a, a, a clause in my contract that says if the unit breaks, I pay the first $500 and the landlord has to pay the rest because they're old units. They're 19 year old units when I first moved in. So I'm not going to I'm not going to take responsibility for 19 year old units. If they were like a year or two, then, yeah, that could be put in there that I could then take responsibility for it. So once you've gone through all these here and you've decided you're going to do it on your own and you have the capital to do it, even if you don't, I mean, you could even go with an existing space for number eight. And number eight is, are you going to use a curriculum? And if you are going to use a curriculum, whose curriculum are you going to use? A lot of jujitsu schools don't have a curriculum. We all know they claim to, do, to have one, but it's nothing written down. There's no order, or rhyme, or reason to it. It's just... Just do this and do this. In fact, whenever they teach, it's, oh, what am I going to teach today? Oh, let me see what Gordon Ryan's doing today in, the latest, in his latest video. Okay, I'll teach that. Oh, ooh, that's pretty cool. Let me teach that to the students. That's how a lot of instructors teach. They don't go off a curriculum. But are you going to? 
It doesn't matter if you do or you don't. You can be successful either way. Don't, don't make me let you think that you need to have a curriculum. It's just a question that you might want to ask. So once you've gone through all this important stuff, now comes the less important part, but something that you might want to think about. Are you going to be an affiliate of an existing master? Or are you going to go off on your own, right? You're going to be, you know, John Smith Jiu-Jitsu? Or are you going to be John Smith Academy as an affiliate to so-and-so Gracie? Or anybody else. It doesn't really matter. But are you going to, are you going to hit your wagon to another master? Right? That's something you need to think about. The reason why someone would affiliate with someone or franchise with someone is because that would bring instant credibility, so to speak, right? Here you are, you're just John Smith, and but you're running a school for so-and-so Gracie. You know, you even get to use their name on your signage. You don't have to put your name. You can say, this is so-and-so Gracie Academy of Los Angeles, California. So people who don't know you will know that particular Gracie family member and they'll go, ooh, I want to go and train with you. Boom, right? That's your affiliate or it could be a franchise. Franchise is a little different business model, but you're really doing the same thing. This helps getting people into your door. People who wouldn't look at you if, if you didn't have that. But you're going to have to pay for that. So now that's an added cost that you're going to have to pay over and above your rent and all that kind of stuff. And finally, the last one, number 10, what's your marketing plan? There's two things that really that come that people get confused. One is marketing, one is sales. Marketing is how do you bring people to you? So if you think of fishing, there's this thing that they call the chum bucket, and it's just really gross fish parts. And what they'll do is they'll dump that overboard. They'll take some, they'll dump it overboard, just put it into the water. And that chum is what brings all the fish to the area. That's marketing. Now what you have to do is you have to now hook the fish and bring them in. That's sales. You can't hook and bring anybody in if there's nobody, there's no fish in the water. On the other hand, you can be really good at marketing people. I mean, you can throw all that chum in there, get the fish into you, but if you have no way to close the sail, you can't get the fish in the boat. I mean, you don't have a fishing pole with a hook. How are you going to get them? You're going to, get them. You're going to see all the fish there, but how do you get them in? So it's a two-pronged process. They're very related. Here's the thing. You either are a natural marketer, which is great. If you're not a natural marketer, then we have this and this and this part coming in. So this, this, and this. So you, if you're an owner, you're going to have to do your own marketing. Therefore, you should probably learn about being an entrepreneur. And if you've never run a business, you better get some advice on how to do marketing. Another thing, if you do not know how to market, marketing costs big bucks. And if it does, do you have enough capital here? Remember I mentioned that $100,000. With your rent and with your, your, your costs and marketing in there because you need to have somebody going to throw all that chum in the water for you. Then you have to learn how to close sales. If you don't know how to close sales, you need to have somebody do it for you. Everybody that you have do something that you don't personally do is going to cost you money. On the other hand, if you do it, it may not cost you money, but it'll cost you time. What is worth more, your money or your time? You're going to have to really think about that. So, you want to run a BJJ school, huh? Get all these things in your mind, think about it, and once you can answer all these questions, then I would suggest you go to the next step. Because once you go through to think of all this, you may realize, mm, I don't want to run a school. Or you may run through it and go even more so, I want to run a school. So when it came to me, what's my story about this? Well, when I was in California, I didn't have a school. I just trained under Dave Kama, trained at Kama Jiu-Jitsu, Laguna Niguel. However, when I moved over here, Master Dave asked me, are you going to open a school? Nope. I'm just going to find some places to train and train there, right? Um, you know, being a Dave Kama black belt, people were coming to me to train. Message me, hey, you know, can I come train? Yeah, I got mats in my garage and I would do that. 
But what happened was these, you know, I'd have guys come into my garage and train and it wasn't really a training session anymore. It became a class because people want to know the stuff that we do because it's different. So next thing you know, I'm teaching. And then I started to get more people. People asked me for privates and all that kind of stuff. So it got to be more of an activity. I thought to myself, you know what? If I'm going to do this, when am I going to get my time to train? Well, I went to a local neighborhood school, school out, just outside of my town, actually, trained there. And this particular individual saw me as a threat. Didn't see me as somebody, hey, you know, I can use you over here. He saw me as a threat. And because of that, told me I couldn't train there unless I signed something called a non-compete. So I didn't sign it because who knows what's going to happen later on down in life. Uh, and so I just said, nah, I'm not going to sign it. He said, okay, well, you can't train here. But like I said, had he simply asked me, hey, Ryan, can you teach a class or two every week in exchange for training here? I'd have said, absolutely. And I would have been happy. But things didn't fall that way. So I had to decide what am I going to do? So that was the why. If I'm going to teach, I might as well teach a team now, right? Rather than just teaching a few people that train at other schools, you know, it wasn't really my thing. I just wanted to train, but if I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach. So did I, I'm going to be an instructor for hire and owner. Well, I talked to master Dave about it and we said, let's open a Kama Jiu Jitsu studio in North DFW. So we went that route. I had already read the e-myth so I already knew what it was about. I had already run business, but I still seek advice. But I, I already I had experience there. Business plan, already wrote it. And yes, we do follow the plan. Existing space or new space? Well, we started off with an existing space. We eventually moved to a new space. So being that you have fewer available time slots, right? Our first classes were at 8 and 8.30 p.m. Nothing before that. And I ran classes five days a week, Monday through Friday, right? So I'd get home midnight typically because we trained for a long time because we could close the studio down at that point. But I couldn't do anything in the six o'clock hour. I couldn't do a kid's program. So that would severely limit your growth if you're going to do this. Do you want to grow or not? Do you just want to run a, a hobby school? Yeah, you can do that. Existing space. Right? Eventually, we did get to our own space because we did start to pick up a lot of students. But it's because another facility that I moved to gave me more time slots. So every time I moved, every time I moved our facility, we got a little more, a, a, a bit more time slots. Moved again, get a bit more time slots. But that's something that was in the plan to, to be able to expand it. But also, with regard to capital, neither Dave nor I took any money out of the school. Whatever money the school earned in memberships went right back into the school. Went to pay rent, they went to pay for, you know, even stuff like cleaning supplies and water and, and uniforms to keep on hand for the new members. So because of the fact that I wasn't doing this as a full-time job, Dave doesn't do it as a full-time job either, all the money that was ever earned went right back into the school. Curriculum, yes, we have one, Hickson's curriculum, right? Affiliate or franchise, no. Why? You know, Dave Kama, Dirty Dozen, Hicks and, Hicks and Gracie Black Belt, don't need one. But other people may need one. Marketing plan, uh, yes, it got developed. So we started off, we, we laid it out in the plan, but as time goes on, you need to start putting some resources behind that planned plan. And yes, Kama Jiu-Jitsu does spend a pretty good amount on marketing. Right. So to do these videos for you, by the way, this wasn't really the, the YouTube marketing wasn't really originally coming out as marketing. It was just I had to put videos out because as I get new students, they keep asking me the same questions. You know, the history about jujitsu, you know, where did jujitsu come from, um, Carlos and Elio and all that kind of stuff. So that's why our original videos were put on and they were put on very low quality. And uh, I happened to bump into Rusty one day. He emailed me and most people when I get emails, I just. I don't answer them. But his one, for some reason, I felt like answering, and I did. And, and Rusty's been with me ever since 2015, 16? 2017. Was it 2017? So Rusty's been a big part of our marketing, you know, a large part of our marketing, uh, for the last three years now. And that costs money, right? Not only for Rusty's time, but also you need equipment, 
And sometimes the equipment you buy, it's not really what you're looking for. You have to buy some other equipment. You got to you got to kind of play around with it. But also, you have to you have to put ads out there on Facebook and Google and all that, and that stuff can run up into the thousands of dollars a month. So there is a whole bunch of things that you really want to know. I hope that this has been able to illuminate this to you as far as running a school. In fact, one of my instructors had told me his his three-year plan and he was saying he wanted to run a school. When I ran through these questions in our conversation with him, at the end of the day, he goes, you know what? I just want to teach. I don't want to take time away from teaching to run a business. So he still has time to think about it, but it, it did open his eyes because at first all he thought about, you know, it'd be cool if I had my own school. Well, yes, it is cool to have your own school, but sometimes you don't want to have your own school. I'll give you an example. John Danaher, right? He doesn't have his own school, but he is, from what I understand, he's the man there. Right? I think he controls a lot of what goes on in the daily activities of Hensel Gracie's school. Hensel Gracie, he's the name behind it. You know, everybody comes. He's, he's the one that attracts everybody. You know, he taught all the guys that were probably were coming up. But at some point in time, you see him just start stepping away. Someone like Dan or her takes over or other person. I don't know. I've never been there. I've never talked to them. So I don't know exactly. I'm just telling you from somebody who runs a school from the outside looking in, that could be. Right? Danaher chose not to break off and create the John Danaher Academy because he has his, uh, what, the Danaher hit squad within Hansel Gracie's school. So it's almost like he's got his own thing going, but he doesn't have to deal with the headaches of running a business. That may be a better situation for you. Don't know. Anyway, there's a lot more to this than what we talked about. This video is getting kind of long here, so I just kind of want to end it here. If you have any questions, go ahead and hit us below. Uh, if you want to get on a call with me, you can feel free. Uh, Rusty will have the link for clarity, and you can just uh, call me. And we can or set up a time, and we can we can do that that way. I'd be happy to spend time on your situation only. Um, if not, just uh, keep watching, hit the subscribe, and it really helps us out if you hit that like and share the video because that's how we can deal with the algorithms and stuff. And lastly, um, like we had announced earlier. We have KamaJujitsu.com and you can log on and get onto our online curriculum. It's being built. Actually, I take it back. It has been built. You know, our Karma, who, who's also part of our marketing team, he's, all, he's built it out already. And we're just starting to add content to it. So it's uh, kind of like how we had a Patreon, but cheaper and better. In that, it's going to be much more laid out. Our curriculum will be laid out in a, in a much more logical fashion. It'll be teaching you linearly rather than circularly. And what we do is we'll, we'll lay out need to know concepts. And we're gonna have the good to know stuff on there as well, but it's gonna be laid out for you in a nice, easy fashion that makes learning jujitsu relatively easy. Just need a partner in time and diligence. So go ahead and check us out, KamaJujitsu.com, and let us know. Give us some feedback on the site. Um, if you want to join one of our members, we'd love to have you there. Uh, we've got great things that are planned for that. I can't really go over a lot of what we have planned. It's not just simply a site where you get on as a member and just watch videos. There's a whole lot more coming. Uh, but uh, hopefully you got on with our founding members drive that, uh, that that karma set up for us if you didn't that's fine it's still going to be cheap it's not expensive at all anyway that's all i got for you take care happy training bye now like my new shirt Today is the day. Pigs fly. <laughs>